on Friday, April 2nd, 2004, at about 5 p.m. My wife was returning by herself from a trip to drop off her daughter at a friend's house west of Wabi Lake in Milford, Indiana. She was traveling east on County Road 1100 North. She approached the intersection, which leads into Oswego, and came to a stop at the stop sign. She looked left, right, and briefly ahead. Before beginning her turn, she noticed movement directly ahead on the road. She saw crossing the road from left to right, heading south approximately 250 feet ahead. Two large, black, hair-covered figures, taller than an average man, walking on two legs at a hurried pace. Her first reaction was to say out loud, what the heck was that? They were walking very close together, and hurrying suggested that they were aware that they were exposed in the open and wanted to get back to cover quickly. By the time she saw them, they were in the middle of the road, but she saw them take five to seven steps over several seconds. They were stooped forward and looking down, swinging their long arms quickly. After this, they entered the woods. She said they were close enough to have scared her if they had looked her way. Also, they were close enough to see they were not just men in black clothing, as there were no divisions where shirt, pants, and a hat would be only solid black from head to toe. My wife, who is a college-educated professional, then made her turn onto 300 East, thinking she would then have something interesting to tell me immediately upon arriving home. When she reached home, however, something else unusual happened. Instead of telling me, she apparently blocked out or repressed the experience from her memory, as if in complete denial. I have been a Bigfoot enthusiast for many years and have read of this happening before people seeing a Bigfoot. It is like your mind refuses to believe what the eyes are telling it because it is so new, different, and without a reference point. About two days later, we were talking. I said something that brought her all back to it suddenly. She then told me the whole experience in detail, showing sign of alarm and even imitating the way they walked. Of course, I wasn't about to believe her without asking questions. After all, I was the biology major in college. I'm the outdoorsman, and I'm the Bigfoot enthusiast, and I'm the one who should have seen them. I asked all the typical questions that interviewees ask, and she answered them all correctly, even adding additional detail. I asked if they might have possibly been some young high school guys in black gothic clothes, as some like to wear. The answer was that they were absolutely not men in black clothes. The thought also occurred to me that she was messing with me, playing a joke to mislead me, so I asked her. This was the last straw. She got hurt and angry with me for not trusting her after 27 years of marriage, and I got the silent treatment for two days and had to do a lot of apologizing. I'll just have to agree with her, based on the evidence she saw two Bigfoots crossing the road. Wish I had seen them. Hopefully, by learning as much as I can about this creature, I will be able to remain calm enough to stay and observe it, if I ever see one, instead of freaking out and running, as most do. Some may say that your wife learned all this from listening to you go on and on about what you read on the internet. Believe me, when she tells her story, you can tell it was a very real experience for her, whether anyone believes her or not, she knows what she saw, and will say so. Okay, not just a story. This happened to us recently, here at home one night. Friday night, October 10th, 2003. Saturday morning, approximately 1am. My son and two of his friends were coming home late one night just about one in the morning, on a Saturday morning, after recent homecoming activities. Since their plans had gotten changed, I wasn't expecting them home. They were supposed to stay somewhere else. When they pulled into the yard, I was already in bed, halfway sleeping. When I awoke to the sound of somebody pounding on the front door and yelling excitedly, then I heard my name, 
and dad coming from them. So, I slowly pulled myself from bed and made my way to the front room, where I heard the sound of one of the bedroom windows sliding open. My son came falling through and ran to the front door just about the same time. I reached it, so we opened it and let his other two friends in. They came in very quickly, in a jumbled mess of excitement. They began telling me about it being down there and coming up here, and all sorts of things. I was too groggy to understand. Saturday after work, I finally sat down with two of them to hear it all again and got the whole story, in order, and without all the confusion there had been the night before. Here's how they explained it. After pulling into the yard up near the trailer, they walked in the dark up to the porch and started to knock. Friday night, the 10th of October was right around a full moon, and the sky was absolutely clear that night. As they walked up to the porch to knock, one of the three looked back over his shoulder because he heard something and noticed a stump down in the yard, about 150 feet away, near the boats at the edge of the water. The other two looked then to see what he was talking about when the stump got up and just stood there. Even in the moonlight, they could see it was not a deer, not anything except the form of a person, because it stood there directly facing them and they could see it easily. So, as they began to knock more excitedly, it began to walk away quickly to the east on the shoreline, but then abruptly turned around and began to move much quicker right back across the yard where it had been toward the marshy area and light woods and tall grass immediately south of the porch and trailer. When my son saw this, he came running around the trailer and let himself in through the window. Now the other two could hear the sound of this guy running heavily into the tall grass, sticks, branches, and all the stuff that was down in the woods between the trailer and the lake, but then heard it starting to move closer up the hill. That's when the hard pounding and yelling to let them in really began. We let the other two in, locked the door. I went back to bed while they stayed up half the night, rehashing what had taken place and how it freaked them out. Four hours later, I was up, ready for work, and out the door at 5.25 a.m. My son had to get up and briefly talk me through what they had seen earlier. Even at 5.30 in the morning as I was leaving, the moon had made it mostly west in the early morning sky and was still so bright that I could easily make out every tree, patch of grass, boat at the shoreline. Every little thing we're used to seeing out here. Back at 1 a.m. when this happened, it was even much more illuminated with the moon directly overhead, especially with the light bouncing off the water as well. So maybe it was just some guy squatting and then standing at five inches of lake water at 1 a.m. in the middle of the country. Well, when I'm six foot and about 200 pounds and they see some guy who's way taller than me and a lot larger and built a lot larger, way taller, way larger, and gruntly slightly as he ran. We only have one neighbor, and knowing them, they don't run around in the yard or standing lake water at one in the morning, or noon for that matter. He's also not approximately in the range of eight feet tall and built large at the height. Then my son reminds me when I asked what it looked like. He says, you know, like that thing that I saw about a year ago up between the sheds one night. You see, somewhere about a year ago, he and a friend were running around with flashlights and a paintball gun after dark, when they see what they thought was a stray dog laying in some tall grass between two of our outdoor sheds. They decide to shine the light on it and then shoot a couple of paintballs at it when it starts to get up, revealing that it isn't just a dog, just some large hairy creature, bigger than a man, but we don't know what it was, so we just kind of ran. They never saw a face, but did see large eyes that reflected an orange reddish black back at them when the flashlight hit it, as it seemed to turn its head slightly toward them. When they did see the eyes reflecting back and realized that it was indeed a head, they observed that there was no muzzle of any sort. 
that's when they realized it wasn't a dog. They didn't stick around for it to get up all the way off the ground. They could see that as it was getting up, it was large, hairy, more like a person and not a dog. So he really felt like this October sighting was the same thing that they had seen six or more months ago. And that's basically it. After much grilling on my part, I do believe them. I didn't see it myself. I wish I had the presence of mind that morning to grab a gun and stand on the porch to see if something didn't make its way up the hill in the little bit of woods. Why I didn't, I'm not sure. Too late to speculate. Only thing to do now is plan for the next time. The past several months, we have had some very strange activity going on around our house. We live out in the country, and we've ignored a lot of it. But here lately, we can't ignore the activity going on. About a month or two ago, my husband went outside to smoke, and he heard something and as he looked in our driveway, he seen an animal that stood about seven feet tall, all hairy. He couldn't explain it, except that it looked like one of our dogs on two feet and extremely tall. It walked past our trailer, and that's how he could guess that the height could be. We've heard what sounded like a baseball bat hitting a tree. We've heard whistles and calls of what Bigfoot sounds like. We've had chickens and cats go missing. Every night, about the same time, you can hear footsteps and sounds. It's to the point to where we are scared to go outside. We've never believed in Bigfoot till we've seen it and have heard them. I'm sure there are more than one around because we live near caves. They sound like they are all around us at night. We had a ball in our yard and after finding it in the woods one day and down the road from us another day and bring it back several times, it went missing and we've not been able to find it since. I just find it odd that this has just happened after we've been hearing noises that sounded like Bigfoot. We were camped along Marble Creek at Donkey Creek near Avery, Idaho, July 2019. It was a weekday, so no other campers were within miles. Deep mountain valleys and dense woods. I was chopping food for dinner. My husband and small children were fishing at the Loud Creek. I'm an avid birder, obsessed. I must know every call I hear. And that evening, I heard a call that sounded like an old-fashioned crank police siren. It was echoing through the valley and came from a higher altitude. Howls of the same timbre and pitch, but slightly varying length. I thought it was an owl. I must not know. Wolves and cougar don't sound like that. My dog did not bark. She hid under the table. I also considered that maybe some kids were playing with an old police siren. But then I realized there was no way kids could have been up there near the ridge with something that heavy. Plus, no one else was up there. When I got back into cell reception, I searched through owl calls and found nothing similar. But I found that call on other Bigfoot websites. It was the Ohio Howl. I live in Wisconsin and have been interested in Sasquatch my entire life. I have been a hunter for 44 years and know sounds, footprints, and behavior of just about every creature in Wisconsin. I have always wanted to become involved in actively looking for Sasquatch. In 2015, I started researching sightings and incidents in Wisconsin and discovered the northern third of the state had many reports in Phillips, Prentice, and Price counties as well as the national forests. My husband is also interested, so we decided to research areas of some reported sightings. We spent a great deal of time walking around the forest off of Highway 17 near Winter, Wisconsin. We documented our findings using video cams and photographs. I have a photo of what I believe is a Sasquatch print in the forest near some tree bends and a small ground glyph that was about five yards from the print. A year later, we discovered that the glyph had been modified with additional sticks and limbs. We have photographs of tree bends and breaks and trees woven together that no human could manage, and since 2015, have actively returned to the same area of the forest to see if there are no changes or anything new. 
and I've also had a response to a wood knock that I did in the summer of 2018. The area of the return knock is in the area that has no homes, roads, or trails. Beginning in 2016, my oldest sister, my daughter and I decided to set up camp near Loretta, and each summer we would spend time camped and actively researching and have many photographs. On June 6th through 9th, 2019, we once again set up our camp in the same campground, but in a different site that we had not used before. At the end of the row, on the southwest side of the camp, there is nothing for miles behind that spot. We did not see anything unusual when we hiked through the forest earlier in the day, but on our last night, a bear walked through our campsite just before dark, so we decided to hit the bunks early. It was around 10 to 10.30 p.m. when I heard a rustling around the camper. It's a modified camper with a deck that has a zipper tent extending from the camper with a tarp material around the bottom. The creature was crinkling and fiddling around with the bottom portion of the extended porch and making the tarp crackle. I thought the bear had returned and was rustling around camp and expected the camp to be destroyed in the next morning. The noise went on for about a half an hour, and then it stopped. My daughter and sister were asleep. Less than 30 minutes later, a handful of rocks hit the side of the camper, followed by three more rounds of rocks, and finally, a larger rock hit the camper roof. This woke my sister, who sleeps with earplugs. She later says she does not know why she woke up, but I believe it was the sound of the big rock hitting above her head. By then, my daughter was awake as well. It was quiet the rest of the night. The next morning when it was light out, I bailed out of the camper, expecting to see a ripped up camp, but all was pristine. The first morning at camp, my daughter set up a hammock behind and slightly to the side of the back of the camper. When she was taking it down, she found a rock in the hammock. My theory is that whatever threw rocks had to lob them over her hammock, and one either bounced back and fell into the hammock or pinged off the tree and landed in the hammock. We were the only campers in the campground, except for a man that came in with his rig. He left the next morning. Many areas have tree bends, twists, a possible footprint, all in the forest just east and north of the campground where the rock throwing incident occurred. I was with a friend of mine behind his grandmother's house. We had seen some dead fish near a pond, broke in half, so we went back later that day to look, to see what might have caused it. We went about 100 yards in the woods, when my friend had to go use the bathroom, so he walked away from me, when I heard a noise off to my right. I looked, and see something looking around a tree, about 50 to 75 yards away. I could make out on fur of the outline of the shape. It looked like it was about 8 feet tall. I seen it take a step and then I took off running back to the house. I was the only one that seen it. He just noticed me running back to the house. He was using the bathroom. I was having a small campfire last night alone with my small dog who at the time was sleeping. First, there was something moving through the wooded area to my left. Sounded like it was on two feet and moving towards some neighbor's houses. I wasn't alarmed by this, Although it was dark and there were no flashlight, the neighbors do walk through there from time to time. My dog was not alerted at all. This part of the incident may just be coincidental, but it's what happened next that I'm curious about. About five to 10 minutes later, to the left of me, way off in the distance, there was an obvious wood knock, then immediately to the right of me in the distance, but in the direction is the Great Croton Swamp, was reply wood knock and then immediately after that, another from the left, then nothing. I've never heard anything like that before. It was about 11 p.m. and the neighborhood was quiet, and in my opinion it was an obvious call and response. Are wood knocks usually so instantaneous, or do they usually have some time in between? Me and two friends were walking up to the gas pipeline to fish a natural spring on the mountain now privately owned by a hunting and fishing club. As we crested our first hill, all three of us stopped at the same time. We saw a Bigfoot about 200 feet up the pipeline. 
I would estimate it to be about seven feet tall, brown and very shaggy. After about 30 seconds, it ran into the wood line. It covered about 30 feet and three strides and disappeared. As we got to where it was, you could see four spots where the tall grass was pushed down from its steps. My friend says Bigfoot threw rocks at him in the 70s, about five miles away. I live in Greenville, Texas, north of town, just off of Highway 69 North. I have lived here 12 years and have had strange things going on at my house since I moved here. But in the last two to three years, things have really started happening more. I live down a dirt road off of Highway 69. There are a lot of woods around me. Also have several neighbors around me too. And in late summer of 2017, I was jolted awake in the middle of the night by a loud banging on my house. I knew I wasn't dreaming because I shot straight up. And at that exact moment, my two little dogs flew off my bed barking and carrying on. I stumbled into the kitchen, wondering what could be happening, and it was 2.38 a.m. My two big dogs outside were not barking, which I thought was odd. To make a long story short, I called the sheriff's department. Two deputies came out and found nothing. From that moment on, Every two or three months, I have several incidents for a week or two, then nothing for another month or two or three. Then things will happen again. This past winter, from November 2019 to February 2020, I've had several things happen. On three separate occasions, while I've been propped in bed watching TV, I have heard a loud growl outside my bedroom, loud enough to hear over the TV. It was loud and guttural. I have had tapping on the back of my house during the night. It's usually always around the same time of night. In January of 2020, I was once again propped up in my bed watching TV, and over my TV, I heard something rubbing on the back of my house, on the wall where my bathroom is. My bedroom and bathroom run together. My two little dogs jumped off the bed into the bathroom at the back wall, barking. I've had rocks thrown at my house. I'm home alone most of the time, but this past Saturday night, April 18th, 2020, my husband happened to be home. Between 11 p.m. and 11.30 p.m., my dog starts barking and wouldn't stop, so I get up to holler as to her to hush. As I got to my bedroom door, my cat was lying in my rocking chair next to my door. I paused to pet her, and about that time, I heard that same loud guttural growl at my back door. My cat heard it wheeled around and looked at the back door. I went and woke up my husband. He looked out at the back and saw nothing. I went to the front door and opened it and he called my dog. She would not get close to the fence and was barking, looking towards the back of my house, towards my neighbor's home behind me. All of a sudden, she jumped back, like whatever it was was coming towards her. I ran to my guest room to look out the window facing that direction and back towards northwest. I saw something huge and dark in color going across my neighbor's back pasture, moving fast. My neighbor behind me lives alone, and she has had the same things happen at her house. On October 7th, 2017, my wife, myself, and our dog went on a late season kayak paddle to Upper Priest Lake and overnight camping trip at Beaver Creek Campground. After loading the kayak after our paddle, we drove half a mile to the campground, only to find that it was closed for the season. Not wanting to find another campsite, we drove around the campground to Tool Bay Boat Launch parking area, which was still open. We parked our vehicle, unloaded our tent, sleeping and cooking gear, and began to set up camp, carrying things into a designated site that would normally be accessed by the campground road. I was a bit concerned about camping in the site after the campground was officially closed, but figured that it was already getting dark. It was unlikely that we would be confronted by a ranger. It had been raining and was getting cold, and my wife wanted a campfire to warm up our paddle to Upper Priest Lake. I didn't want to start a fire, as I was still uneasy about camping there and concerned that a fire would attract attention to us. After setting up the tent and getting things situated, we heard a who call to the north of us, across the road. I had the distinct impression that it wasn't an owl, but a person wooing 
for somebody in the dark woods, like someone trying to contact a hiker who was late getting back to the car, though there were no other cars in the area. The call was quite loud, louder than any owl I have ever heard. To me, it seemed like it was coming from something, a person with very large lung capacity. By this time, it was dark, and we couldn't see anything beneath the tree canopy outside of our campsite. While my wife worked on starting a fire with wet branches, unsuccessfully, I arranged our sleeping gear in the tent. Suddenly, we heard a woo call that was much closer and much louder. This call made us nervous, as we both felt it was made by a person who was camping around our campsite in the dark, messing with us. But we had heard no vehicles drive in, saw no headlights or flashlights, and it was too dark and overcast for a person to drive or walk around the woods without a light. My wife has better hearing than I do, and heard what she felt was an answering who from some distance away in the forest. Grabbing a flashlight, I walked 75 feet or so back to our vehicle to get my 9mm pistol. There was no question that this was not an owl. The call was much too loud and gave both of us a fearful feeling. I could feel the loudness of the call in my chest. We noticed that our dog had no reaction to the calls, remaining in camp and not acting scared, but I sure felt that way, even with a firearm on my hip. After the last loud call, we didn't hear anything more the rest of the night. No vehicles drove into the boat launch parking area, and we heard no people or animals about. In the morning, I looked around our campsite, but couldn't see that anything had been disturbed. Later back home, my wife researched owl calls online, but couldn't find anything that sounded like what we had heard. Whatever had made those calls around our campsite that night knew we were there and had a lung capacity much larger than an adult human male. Last fall, 2019, while on a motorcycle ride up Tango Creek, which was approximately 15 miles from our incident, we saw a fir tree, about five feet in diameter, broken off about the eight to nine foot tall off the ground, near a trail by a pull-out parking area. No other trees in the area had been damaged. It was last year, 2019, around mid-October, near the Blue Ridge Parkway. Me and my boyfriend were working for the Roanoke Times, delivering newspaper when this encounter happened. We delivered anywhere from 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. We were almost done with the route when we went to turn down this dead-end maintenance road, since there was houses at the end of that who got paper. It was around 3.30 to 4 a.m. While my boyfriend was going down the gravel and maintenance road, the headlights caught a glimpse of this thing standing right at where the grass met the road. It stood about seven feet tall, and it took off up the hill. And it kind of walked fast, not necessarily ran. It was dark brown and had shaggy hair like fur. It was on two feet and walked like a human with its arms swaying back and forth, right below the knees. I screamed out for my boyfriend to stop the car. But by the time his reaction time kicked in, whatever it was already made its way up the hill. My boyfriend positioned the car so the lights would shine up the hill, and that's when we saw two bright glowing red-yellow eyes looking back at us. What was strange when it was hiding behind a huge tree and how high the eyes were up from the ground, it was close to seven feet tall. You could clearly see the eyes blink. We sat there for approximately ten minutes, and finally, decided to finish up the route and come back. We did eventually come back after we got done with the last house, and it was gone. But you could see where the tree limbs and grass was pushed down from where it was standing on the side of the road. Maybe less than a month before we had the encounter, we had heard tree knocks while on our route, from deep down in the woods, maybe a neighborhood or two over. It scared us so bad when we heard it that we just bagged the newspaper up and threw it on the side of the road. It was around the year 1989. I was working at McDonald's in Carlinville, and I was closed that night. I was headed home around 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. I was headed west on Illinois Highway 108. I was going through an area on the highway known to the locals as Hagaman Bottoms. Just as I was about to approach the bridge at the bottom of Bell Hill, 
I saw a large creature standing next to the road. Just as I got near it, or just about even with the creature, it reached out at my car. It scared me, and I accelerated my car to get away from it. It was very bright, moonlit night, and I could tell that it was dark brown, or black in color. It was also tall, as it stood above the top of my car. The car I owned at the time was a Chevy Celebrity Eurosport. I remember it standing facing east when I was passing it. It turned south and reached out with its right hand. This was a very scary experience for a young girl in a car going home all by herself. As a child, I grew up in a small town named Fayette. This town is just west of Hagaman Bottoms. At night after the supper meal, we would take food scraps out to the trash burning barrel behind the shed. I would get a feeling like there was always something around or close by and my hair would stand up on my arms and I would get very scared to go out there when it was dark. I never did see anything but just got an eerie feeling like something was watching me. I have had two incidents in the last few months. The first happened one morning when I woke up early and had to use the restroom. On the way back to bed, I looked out the back door to see the sunrise and check if the dog was in the backyard. I watched a large dark person or thing cross the field from one tree line to another. The second happened on the night of the meteor shower just a few weeks ago. I walked outside to look up and watch the shower. I stood there for several minutes before I looked down directly on the other side of the fence was a large form. After I screamed my head off, it bolted to the tree line. It may be completely unrelated, but our dogs have been bringing home several bones from different animals on a semi-weekly basis. I have had several experiences over the years near my home. Five years ago, I was picking blackberries on the back side of my property late June. To the east of the blackberry vines is a farm field. The field was planted in corn, and there was a strip of last year's corn residue at the edge of the field. Old stubble, hard to walk through with boots on. There were a series of footprints coming out of the field, moving towards the woods. There were five prints, about my size, men's 11 or 12, barefoot, wide with no arch, flat-footed. I go barefoot a lot, but no one in their right mind walks through a cornfield with stubble and barefoot. Four years ago, my son and I were in my bedroom, watching videos on my computer, about six in the evening, when something passed by my cabin and beat on the wall as it went by. Scared us to death, the pounding started near the corner of the room where we were in, near the ceiling. This is a good ten feet above the ground level outside. The second was in the other corner of the room. The third hit sounded like it came from above the window in the den, and the fourth and fifth hits were on the bathroom wall. Quick, bam, 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 bam. I live in a log cabin, and it literally shook the house. Next morning, I looked around outside. No prints, nothing on the logs. It was in July and August. Ground was dry and hard. I have ruled the house settling, small animals, birds. No idea what it was. This year, May to June 2012, about 10.30 at night, I was getting ready for bed. My son was in the bathroom. We both heard a low, very guttural grunt. Who? Outside the house. My son is 18, and large, muscular young man, but he came out of the bathroom, pulling up his jeans and looking scared. We ran out onto the porch in time to see something large, dark, and low to the ground run past my neighbor's house. Truthfully, it looked like a gorilla, running flat on all fours. It activated my neighbor's motion sensor lights in front of his home, and about 30 seconds later, the coyotes on the other side of the highway went nuts. It was moving, quarter of a mile in just under a minute. The next day, my father said he also heard the grunt. It woke him up. I sometimes find broken trees and bent trees in the woods. I have also heard screams and howls that I can't just write off as being a deer, bobcat, coyote, or vixen. Whenever my husband works midnights, I can't sleep, so I came outside to sit on my steps and smoke a cigarette. 
I happened to look up because the dogs were barking at something. I looked up and saw this tall black figure standing and kind of peeking out from behind the shed. I looked at it and kind of squinted at it to see what I could see, and it really wasn't moving. I went back inside my house and grabbed the gun. When I came back out, it was gone. I don't know what he was doing there. It was just a big tall black mass peeking out from behind the shed. It was massive. It was big. I jumped up and ran inside to get the gun. I was able to see its head, part of the shoulder and some of the knee. It was leaning out. It was seven foot tall, but it was sort of hunched over too. There is no lighting back there, only in the front of the house. We have a tree line that comes up behind our place. The tree line comes with about a hundred feet of the house. I don't know how many times I've been here by myself and heard something bang on the shed in the back. There were a couple of nights that I went out there with my gun, but every time I've heard a bang like something is hitting on it and the door had been left open. I don't know if something was trying to get in there. I know it's not the door banging because the door is on a track to hold it still. There's been other times by the camper shell I've heard noises. I've run inside and get the big light and shine it over there, but nothing there. There are a lot of unusual noises that I've heard over the years here and there, and I've never been able to put to what it was. There are several times when I've walked back to check the noises at the shed where I felt something was watching me. I've also gotten that feeling a lot at my French doors because I don't have anything over them. I'll be sitting on my couch and feel like someone is looking through that window, and I'll look up and there's nothing there and when I get this feeling, I am home by myself. I have an apple orchard in the back, but of course, this time of year, there aren't any apples. But late last year, a lot of the apples were gone. My husband picks up all the bad ones and throws them out into the field. I got to thinking about this because somebody found a footprint recently between Bunker Hill and Staunton. I have recently moved out of my house in Illinois. During the last year or so, I have experienced several strange occurrences. I have never actually seen anything, except once a large dark shape moving bipedally through the heavy fog. I have heard the sound of something drumming on tree trunks, the sound of something big walking in the woods on two legs. I have found chunks of firewood thrown from my woodpile, and on November 25th of 2008, as I was packing to move, I heard a moaning howl very close to the house. I have hunted for 20 years and I have never heard the likes of this. I stopped loading the vehicle, loaded my 45 and locked the door. I did the rest of my packing and the next two nights armed but as before, I had the distinct feeling I was being watched and several times large branches were broken and there was knocking on trees. Also. There is an area of woods where the grass and foliage is crushed down. This could be deer, but since these things have started occurring, the deer, who are usually thick as fleas, have been gone. Several other people have heard knocking. However, I was alone when the howl occurred, and it is mostly at night. Back in the spring of 1978, at the age of 17, Myself and my high school sweetheart were parking just off of a seldom traveled country road in a county about 10 to 13 miles south of Carlinville and roughly 10 miles west of Gilspie. We were making out on a farm field across in the back seat of my car, parked about 20 feet off the road. The area was fertile, bottom land, just about 50 feet from a bridge over a small creek. There were dense woods around with a small cornfield maybe four acres cut out of the fertile soil alongside of the creek. The night was one I'll never forget. In our young passion, a foul stench came over the area, but the real thrill soon followed. We heard the loudest, most shill scream we could imagine. It was very, very close and extremely loud. It started as several low-toned grunts and exploded into the most frightening shill scream I'd ever heard. It seemed to vibrate the old car we were in. We were both panic-stricken and scared out of our minds. I jumped into the front seat, butt naked, and drove like hell until we were on high ground and away from any woods. I hadn't taken time to dress 
until we were miles away from that spot. We discussed what had happened and decided to keep the whole thing a secret. Actually, we looked at each other and said something like, this didn't happen, did it? The whole thing gave me a fear of the woods that lasted for almost 20 years. But as I looked back on it, I realized whatever it was had been watching us, and at any time, if it were a savage beast, had every chance to do whatever it wanted to do to us. Did we go back later and look for the tracks? No. No way. I avoided that area at all cost, day or night. Did the sound resemble recordings that we hear of Bigfoot? Well, actually it did indeed, but amplified by a hundredfold. I recall as small children, the screams of what the local Illinois farmers call the mountain lion. We had several cattle maimed, and that scream was nothing like the one we had heard that evening. It was just so chilling. I live in Greenville, Texas, north of town, just off of Highway 69 North. I have lived here for 12 years and have had strange things going on at my house since I moved here. But in the last two to three years, things have really started happening more. I live down a dirt road off of Highway 69. There are a lot of woods around me. Also have several neighbors around me too. In late summer of 2017, I was jolted awake in the middle of the night by a loud banging on my house. I knew I wasn't dreaming because I shot straight up, and at that exact moment, my two little dogs flew off my bed barking and carrying on. I stumbled into the kitchen wondering what could be happening and it was 2.38 am. My two big dogs outside were not barking, which I thought was odd. To make a long story short, I called the sheriff's department. Two deputies came out and found nothing. From that moment on, every two or three months, I have several incidents for a week or two, and then nothing for another month or two or three, and then things happen again. This past winter, from November of 2019 to February 2020, I have had several things happen. On three separate occasions while I have been propped in bed watching TV, I have heard a loud growl outside my bedroom loud enough to hear over the TV. It was loud and guttural. I have had tapping on the back of my house during the night. It is usually always around the same time of night. In January 2020, I was once again propped up in bed watching TV, and over my TV, I heard something rubbing on the back of my house on the wall where my bathroom is. My bedroom and bathroom run together. My two little dogs jumped off the bed into the bathroom at the back wall, barking. I've had rocks thrown at my house. I'm home alone most of the time, but this past Saturday night, April 18th, 2020, my husband happened to be home. Between 11 and 11.30 p.m., my dog started barking and wouldn't stop, so I got up to holler at her to hush. As I got to my bedroom door, my cat was laying in my rocking chair next to my door. I paused to pet her, and about that time, I heard that same loud, guttural growl at my back door. My cat heard it, wheeled around and looked at the back door. I went and woke up my husband. He looked out the back door and saw nothing. I went to the front door and opened it and called my dog. She would not get close to the fence and was barking, looking towards the back of my house, towards my neighbor's home behind me. All of a sudden, she jumped back, like whatever it was was coming towards her. I ran to my guest room to look out the window facing that direction and back towards northwest, I saw something huge and dark in color going across my neighbor's back pasture, moving fast. My neighbor behind me lives alone, and she has had the same things happening at her house. On October 7th, 2017, my wife and myself and our dog went on a late season kayak paddle to the Upper Priest Lake an overnight camping trip at Beaver Creek Campground. After loading the kayak after our paddle, we drove half a mile to the campground, only to find that it was closed for the season. Not wanting to find another campsite, we drove around the campground to the Tool Bay Boat Launch parking area, which was still open. We parked our vehicle, 
unloaded our tent, sleeping and cooking gear, and began to set up camp, carrying things into a designated site that would normally be accessed by the campground road. I was a bit concerned about camping in the site after the campground was officially closed, but figured that it was already getting dark. It was unlikely that we would be confronted by a ranger. It had been raining and was getting cold, and my wife wanted a campfire to warm up from our paddle to the upper priest lake. I didn't want to start a fire, as I was still uneasy about camping there and concerned that a fire would attract attention to us. After setting up the tent and getting things situated, we heard a woo call to the north of us, across the road. I had the distinct impression that it wasn't an owl, but a person wooing for someone in the dark woods, like someone trying to contact a hiker who was late getting back to the car, though there were no other cars in the area. The call was quite loud, louder than any owl I have ever heard. To me, it seemed like it was coming from something, a person with a large lung capacity. By this time, it was dark, and we couldn't see anything beneath the tree canopy outside of our campsite. While my wife worked on starting a fire with wet branches unsuccessfully, I arranged our sleeping gear in the tent. Suddenly, we heard a woo call that was much closer and much louder. The call made us nervous as we both felt it was made by a person who was creeping around our campsite in the dark, messing with us. But we heard no vehicles drive in, saw no headlights or flashlights, and it was too dark and overcast for a person to drive or walk around the woods without a light. My wife has better hearing than I do, and heard what she felt was answering Wu from some distance away in the forest. Grabbing a flashlight, I walked 75 feet back or so to our vehicle to get my 9mm pistol. There was no question that this wasn't an owl. The call was much too loud and gave both of us a fearful feeling. I could feel the loudness of the call in my chest. We noticed that our dog had no reaction to the calls, remaining in camp and not acting scared, but I sure felt that way, even with a firearm on my hip. After the last loud call, we didn't hear anything more than the rest of the night. No vehicles drove into the boat launch parking area, and we heard no people or animals about. In the morning, I looked around our campsite but couldn't see anything that had been disturbed. Later back at home, my wife researched owl calls online but couldn't find anything that sounded like what we heard. Whatever had made those calls around our campsite that night knew we were there and had a lung capacity much larger than an adult human male. It was last year, 2019, around mid-October near the Blue Ridge Parkway. Me and my boyfriend were working for the Roanoke Times delivering a newspaper when this encounter had happened. We delivered anywhere from midnight to 6 a.m. We were almost done with the route when we went to turn down this dead-end maintenance road since there was houses at the end that who got the paper. It was around 3.30 to 4 a.m., while my boyfriend was going down the gravel end maintenance road, the headlights caught a glimpse of this thing standing right where the grass met the road. It stood about seven feet tall, and it took off up the hill. It kind of walked fast, not necessarily ran. It was dark brown and had shaggy hair like fur. It was on two feet and walked like a human with its arms swaying back and forth right below the knees. I screamed out for my boyfriend to stop the car. But by this time, his reaction time kicked in. Whatever it was had already made its way up the hill. My boyfriend positioned the car so the lights would shine up that hill. And that's when we saw two bright glowing red-yellow eyes looking back at us. What was strange was it was hiding behind a huge tree. And how high up the eyes was from the ground was close to seven feet tall. You could clearly see the eyes blink. We sat there for approximately 10 minutes and finally decided to finish up the route and come back. We did eventually come back after we got done with the last house and it was gone. But you could see where the tree limbs and grass was pushed down from where it was standing on the side of the road. Maybe less than a month before we had the encounter, we had heard tree knocks while on our route from deep down in the woods, 
maybe a neighborhood or two over. It scared us so bad when we heard it that we just bagged the newspaper and threw it on the side of the road. My wife and I were taking an evening drive on Highland Scenic Highway 150 to Cranberry Glades area on Tuesday evening, 9616. We had been stopping at the scenic overlooks, taking pictures, and had just left the Williams River overlook and headed south on 150. There was a stretch of highway that was very straight and a downslope of about 4 to 6 percent, one to two miles south of the Williams River overlook. As we were driving, we both noticed something in the weeds between the road edge and the bank leading up to the woods on the west side. At first, I thought it was a deer, when its head and neck stretched up above the weeds. It was about three to four hundred feet ahead, and while we continued towards it, it spun around, similar to about a face, but with the head dropping and a semi-crouch as it was turning. It jumped up onto the bank, reaching for a branch to aid in pulling itself up. By the time it jumped, we were within 80 to 100 feet of it. By the time till we got to where it had been standing, it was nowhere in sight, and we could hear no sounds of running or branches breaking in the piney woods along the road. We both noticed that the weeds at this point and all along the area were even with the hood on a 3-4 to four ton Chevy pickup we were in, making the estimate on the height of the creature about 7.5 feet tall. The creature was a mix of brown and brown gold fur, longer than deer hair but not as long as collie fur. I have never discounted that Sasquatch could be real, but this first-hand experience has removed my doubt. As we left the area, my arms and neck were covered in goose flesh, and we were both speechless for about 10 more minutes. I am a 52-year-old Swedish archaeologist and a proud member of the BFRO. I have attended several BFRO expeditions in North America over the years. North Florida Expedition 2009, Northern California 2009, British Columbia 2009, Vancouver Island South 2009, and the Olympic Peninsula Expedition, also in 2009. I also attended the expeditions in British Columbia in 2016, 2017, and 2019. The North American conferences that I have taken part of was the celebration of John Green and Harrison Hot Springs in 2011, the Sasquatch Summit, and the Bigfoot Conference in Kennewick 2017. I have also been walking around alone in the forests of North America, looking for Sasquatch and footprints. In a hot spot area, a forest in northern Florida, I found an old footprint in the sand in February of 2009. In the mountains above Bluff Creek in northern California, I found a footprint in snow on a mountain road in May 2009. I have pictures of both. I was surprised of how easy it was for me to find footprints of Sasquatch in the USA. I also participated in the conference and expeditions that was organized in Moscow and Siberia in October 2011. I have met eyewitnesses and I have heard many stories from people from US, Canada, and Russia. I know that Sasquatches exist, and I proudly stand for that any time and anywhere. I believe that Sasquatches are bipedal apes, or something more human-like. The future will give us the answer. Anyway, I attended the BFRO 2016 British Columbia Expedition that took place on September 8th to the 11th. On Monday, September 12th, the organizer and the rest of the group left the area where we had the expedition and started to drive back to Vancouver. We were four men in two cars. I was sitting as a passenger in the second car. The sun was shining this day and the landscape was very beautiful to look at. Being a Swedish tourist, I was looking out through the car windows as much as possible and talking to the driver. After driving for some time, Around 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon, we got close to the bridge on Morris Valley Road, Weaver Creek Road, by the 12-kilometer sign. Then I saw movement on the left side of the road. I turned my head to the left and saw for what I would estimate to be about two to three seconds a reddish-brown human-looking figure with an ape-looking head that quickly moved from a trench up towards some trees and then froze. 
The body was still, but the head was locked to the car, and face, eyes, followed the car as the vehicle moved. I had eye contact with the figure, and the eyes were very mean looking. I got really scared by looking into his eyes, and a thought immediately came up in my head. The word ape in Swedish. That's what came into my head. I would call it a reaction based on instinct. The eyes were very frightening, and he really looked like a killer. He looked intelligent, but he also seemed to be aware of the danger of being seen by a human. He was not relaxed. He was worried. The figure that I saw was clearly male. No breasts or broad hips or anything like that. I'm 6'3", and I think that he was just as tall as me easily. He was thin and had no big muscles. He did not look like Patty from Bluff Creek. To me, Patty looks like a bipedal gorilla. I told this to Bob Gimlin when I met him in Kennewick in 2017, and he told me that they come in all sorts of looks and colors, some more ape-like and some more human-looking. The male that I saw looked more like a mixture between an orangutan and a human. He looked like a slender male, around 20 to 35 in human age. He had short reddish-brown hair on his body. For some odd reason that I cannot explain, I did not say anything or do anything. I did nothing. I just froze. I did not even tell the driver or asked him to stop the car. This is very sad because I had the chance of a lifetime. I was well armed. I had two cameras in my side pockets, one knife, one tomahawk, and one bottle of bear spray with me. As a Swede in bear, cougar, or wolf country, I have to watch my back. The driver is a tough man and an experienced Canadian hunter. When we got back to Vancouver, and offloaded the gear, I told Jason about my sighting, but I felt so stupid for not saying anything while we were there. Jason then told me the BC investigator, Bill Miller, had been investigating a sighting that an Italian man had some years earlier on the other side of the bridge. Today, I am ashamed over this and regretful. I should have said and done something. However, I have read so many reports on this website and I know that it is normal to react like this. I hope to someday in the future get a second chance. Two days later on Wednesday, I came back to the place of my sighting in a rented car. I camped at the nearest campsite and spent two days walking around at the place of my sighting looking for that male Sasquatch and footprints. I was really scared when I did this. I saw footprints in the moss on both sides of the road that must have been made by the Sasquatch. They were of my size, even though I doubt so they could have been made by a human. I also saw deer prints in the moss on the other side of the road. I got the impression that he might have been tracking a deer. If I had an experienced tracker, then I would have been able to gather more information. There is a beautiful stream that goes under the bridge, a fresh water stream, and into Harrison Lake. It is a very calm and beautiful place, but it is private property, and there's private property signs all over, so I knew I was trespassing. On the Thursday afternoon, BFRO BC investigator Jason Sackerson came to the place of my sighting and we walked around and looked for signs. 2017 before the second expedition in the area and I was back at the place of my sighting with another BFRO BC investigator and told him what I had seen. In the autumn of 2011, I wrote an essay for a university in my country in archaeology. My topic was Sasquatch. I got Swedish University points for that essay, and I tried in that essay to estimate the IQ level of Sasquatch based on what they do, their behavior, and when they are seen by humans. That essay has come up in my mind recently. What level of intelligence does it take for an animal to understand that it is better to only move the head and not the body in order to not be seen, but also to be able to see the human? I was working as an emergency medical responder in the oil field, sitting on site for a gas well workover near the western end of the Red Rock Road. The job was ending due to spring break up and road bands were partially on, preventing the moving of heavy loads during the day. At this time, the partial bands allowed heavy haul from midnight to 7 a.m. My consultant had directed that I be the last personnel to aggress. 
The last low boy on site was having issues with tie downs, and that delayed his departure from location until approximately 3.30 a.m. Everyone else had been off site by one. I held at location for 20 minutes past the last truck's departure, hoping he would stay far enough ahead of my medical unit to avoid it being peppered by rocks and frozen mud chunks, meaning I entered the red rock at approximately 4 a.m., heading in an easterly direction. I had been on site since 7 a.m. the previous day and was going into my 21st hour of being awake. Because of this, I was being extra careful to pay attention to both sides of the road, maintaining a speed of about 30 to 40 miles an hour, hoping to give me enough reaction time to break for wildlife popping onto the road in front of me. There was a fair amount of wildlife in this area. Deer, elk, lynx, moose, black bear, and I even encountered a grizzly slowly grazing grass in a ditch by the side of the road in this area in the summer before. My MTC, which is a mobile treatment center, was mounted on the bed of a 2500 Dodge Ram 2004 extended cab. I was keeping the high beams on. The lights were illuminating the entire roadbed, the snow slash ice berm, and out another 10 meters both sides of the road. I remember passing the area where the service rigs camp had been set up to the left of the road, thinking it looked pretty empty and deserted. I can make out the area because of the ambient star shine. That, along with last few centimeters of snow on the ground, help give shape and shadow to the snow berms, stumps, trees, and gravel patches of the parking area of the camp. A few kilometers past the rig campsite, the red rock does a gentle S-curve through a stand of mature timber running along both sides of the road, approximately 500 meters. After this red rock comes out on a flat area where a road, Beaver Road, branched off from the right heading south. From there, a graded left curve dropped in a wide arc at about a 4% grade to cross on a single lane temporary bridge over a creek. After crossing the bridge, the road swung in an arc to the right, climbing back up out of the creek's floodplain, again at about a 4% grade. I'm pretty short, 5'2", and occasionally, if the grade was steep enough, I would not be able to see the road directly in front of my rig until I started to level out. Because of this, I had slowed to about 20 kilometers an hour. As I topped the hill, coming up out of the creek, I was just about over to accelerate when a solid five-point elk came out of the right side of the road, hopping over the berm and landing not four feet in front of my fender. Scared the stuffing out of me. Breaking hard, I was glad I had slowed down. I then noticed the condition of the elk. He takes about two steps, coming to a full stop right in front of my rig. Looking closer at the elk, I can see that he is winded. His nose is up, almost like he is going to bugle. His antlers are laying almost parallel to the line of his back. His tongue is hanging out the side of his mouth, where it is clearly visible to me, and the eye I can see is rolled back. I'm thinking, what the heck? It's not rut. Why would this animal be acting like this? The elk stood there for three to five seconds panting, then dropping his head into a normal walking position. He walks off slowly to the left side of the road. My experience with elk and deer and roads has always been, if there's one there, there are usually more. So before I started forward again, I did a check down both sides of the roads, looking off as far as my headlights allowed, looking for any eye shine, and that was when I saw it. The Red Rock, like most gas field roads, had an 80 to 100 meters of clear cut along the right side of the road to allow for the laying in of a pipeline to carry the gas from the wells and the field to the plant. On this section of the Red Rock, the right way was cleared of timber but the tree stumps were still in place, which is the usual condition when the pipe has yet to be laid. The stumps were the gray-brown of trees that had been dead for several years. Between the starlight, the headlights, and the snow, I could identify stumps and the bottom part of the tree trunks of the standing timber at the back of the clear cut right away. Finishing the scan, I had looked forward down the road, and just when I was about to drive on, I caught a motion in my peripheral vision on the right, 
drawing my attention back to that area. At first, I thought it was just a tall stump, as it appeared to be a bit taller than another stump nearby. A slight breeze moved the fur slash hair of this taller stump, and it sort of shimmered like the hollow tips on a grizzly coat in the truck's headlights. Looking closer, I now see what appears to be a round head, no face visible, and two round shoulders. The width from outside shoulder to outside shoulder had to be at least three football helmets wide, or at least one meter. The bulkiness of the shoulders had been another clue that the shape on this form was not that of a bear. This was my aha moment, and I am now thinking I know what it was to be making the elk run. A bear, and by its coloring, a grizzly. I feel the puzzle has been solved satisfactorily and start to move forward, and that's when it stands up on two legs. When I say it stands, what it does is it unfolds in a smooth and easy motion. No swing, no side to side in the way a bear does to keep it in standing position with balance. I am still thinking grizzly bear. Based on its estimated distances from the side of the road, about 10 to 12 meters, the brightness of the area being lit by the high beams and how the upper part of the standing form fades into darkness, I would guesstimate the height to be about 8 feet. It turns its upper body towards the east, and even though I cannot see a face, I get the feeling it is looking further down the road in the direction that I am headed. I have the impression of a head, but it's tall enough that the upper third of the body fades into darkness, that being only slightly a different dark than the standing timber several more meters behind the form. Think dark bluish black for trees, and dark blackish brown for the upper part of the creature. My next surprise is when it drops its arms. The left arm is long enough that I could see the range of motion, shape, and the large shape of a hand in the light of the high beams. This is why I say arms. It has a hand, not a paw. The arm was longer, and the hand was lower than where a human hand would rest beside a human thigh. I am beginning to be overwhelmed by a feeling of disease like I should be sitting still, and that I really should start driving away from this creature. My heart is racing, my hair is on end, and I think, oh my god, as I start carefully forward, half expecting to see another one step up to the road. It takes me a few minutes to think, but I believe I have just seen a Sasquatch. From the time I braked for the elk, to the time I felt compelled to start driving, was probably no more than 25 seconds. My name is JM, and my friend's name is RS, and we were hiking about a mile above Sand Canyon in California. He lost his prescription sunglasses, and we split up to search for them. As I was hiking, I saw a very strange track. It looked human, but it was larger than any human footprint. Also, unless a human was walking a mile from the road barefoot through rough terrain, it couldn't have been a human. I met up with RS, and on the way back, I showed him the print. He is an army veteran from Iraq, and an avid hunter, and he was simply shocked by the footprint. He said to me, Jay, look, you can even see the toe prints. This creature has to be at least seven feet tall. We looked at each other, and I asked him, How old do you think that print is? He answered, It looks to be about three days old. We both decided after finding his sunglasses, we should head back to the car while keeping a very sharp lookout for anything strange. After we had reached home, it started to snow. We both realized it was very fortunate that we got to see that because the snow would have wiped it out. On a day after the snow had fallen, we went hunting up in the Lake Hughes area in California. There were four of us hunting that day, my dad and myself and two good buddies. Well, the deer hunting was not that good that day, so one of my buddies said to us, my wife's uncle is gone from his cabin and won't be back any time soon, so why don't we visit his land and all and just hang out and all have some lunch? Well, he lives by Lake Hughes Road and close to where we were, 
We went over there and unlocked the gate, as he had a key. We went in there, and we had brought some apples for our lunch and all. We had seen some hogs and started feeding them apples. After about an hour and a half of doing this, we heard the horses behind the house or cabin running around and making all kinds of noise. We could not see what was going on, as the house was in the way, but man, were they going nuts. So we all said to each other, let's get over there and see what's up. We did and could not see anything but the horses still going nuts and running in circles. We then looked over the fence and through a gate and seen these huge footprints and smelt something like a dog's that's been wet and rotten eggs mixed. Well, the gate was locked and he went inside the cabin or house and got a key for the gate. So we went over to the prince and I'm 6'5 at this time and weighed 275 pounds. I have a shoe size of 15 for E. These tracks were much bigger than my shoe and they were made with some of them in the snow. I stepped next to them and could not press down and going that deep. I could go maybe three fourths to one inch down. These prints were four inches deep in the snow. They were also two to three inches longer than my foot and much wider. Then I tried to step that far with my step and no way I could I. Then we followed the tracks until they came to this really steep hill. There, this thing went up to this hill on two legs and stepped high enough that even my good buddy, who was a bodybuilder and in great shape, could not climb. I could not even lift my leg that far, and I was 16 years old and pretty limber. No man could lift their leg that high or step that far. No man. Nowhere did we see bear tracks, and even if we did, they don't walk that far on two legs. Whatever this was, it walked along this fence and turned and went back into the woods, and then up this very steep hill. It must have looked at the horses and maybe seen us feeding the hogs. I never seen it, but we got scared and left the ranch. I have told this story to a few people, and they look at me. It could be, but you can tell. They don't think it's real. But when you see things like this, you just know something is out there. Nobody can change my mind on this one. I know what I've seen and it is not set up. Nobody knew we were going to his ranch. And the next ranch over, nobody was home there either. So the only thing that could be is, this was real and not fake. Nowhere did we see any human footprints by any of these tracks or up that steep hill. I know something is going on up there. I lived in the high desert of California in Ridgecrest in Kern County from 1980 to 1985. I did a lot of hiking in the Sierra Nevada mountains. I never saw or heard of anything unusual during that time. My mom, sister and family and brother and his family still live there. My 19 year old son and I were visiting various family members from September 17th through September 27th, 2007 in Ridgecrest, California. My sister took me and my son up to Seibert Family Gold Mine, cabin, and mining equipment on the 24th of September. We had spent about an hour at this location and we were preparing to leave. My sister was in the porta potty and my son and I heard this high pitched scream like a woman hollering. We yelled back thinking it was a woman in trouble, but there was no reply. I asked my sister if she had heard it and she said no. I told her what we had heard and she told me that she had a horse backed and hiked through this area and had never heard anything that would make that kind of sound. She has lived in this area since 1980. I asked her husband who's an avid hunter, horseback trail rider and hiker in these mountains and he said that he knew of no animal that made a high pitched scream in this area. My brother-in-law also lived in Ridgecrest, California area all of his life. In late September 1989, I was deer hunting about five miles west of Walker's Pass along Highway 178. I had driven a short ways off the highway and then walked about a quarter of a mile to a rocky bluff that was at the base of a very large steep mountain. I believe it was Pinion Peak. While sitting there in the dark, I continually had the feeling that I was being watched. I have had the same feeling two other times, and in both situations, I spotted a mountain lion watching me from a distance. 
As the gray light came, I started glassing the steep, dense mountain behind me and looking for whatever it was that was watching me. I really could not see very much as it was still fairly dark and the brush was so thick. I cannot remember how long it was that I was glassing the area when a very loud, booming scream echoes from the mountain behind me several hundred yards up. It sounded almost like a terrified woman screaming as loud as she could. At first, I thought that somebody was just playing a hoax on me. The more I looked at how steep the mountain was, the time of day, early morning because I only had gray light, and how dense it is up there, the more uneasy I became. I left the area immediately. I was about 14 years old, riding a horse on a ranch that my family owned. The ranch location is somewhere in California, I won't disclose where. I was on a trail going towards the edge of the forest, still on our property. When I reached the edge of the forest, there was a dead cow. It had been dead for some time now, because it was mostly just bones. When I looked around, still on my horse, that's when I saw a Bigfoot. He was really tall, black, and so human-like. He looked at me, but was not scared. I said to myself, that's Bigfoot. Bigfoot had one hand and arm leaning up against a giant tree, and he looked to be both man and ape. Bigfoot looked right at me, and we both just looked at each other. I was so scared that I turned around and went back to the ranch. I've blocked this out of my mind for many years, I believe from being scared to death. I spoke to my dad about the ranch. I asked him, do we still own 10,000 acres in the ranch? He said no, and is now 90 years old. I asked him did anybody ever say they saw Bigfoot, and he said yes. I could take you to the spot where I saw him, and I'm sure somebody who lives in that area would say they have seen him also. Why? Because he is there. He is out there, living. This happened 28 years ago, but I remember it very clear now for some reason, and how he looked at me. I am a long-term seasonal with the U.S. Forest Service. I do know the different tracks the wildlife leaves behind. What I and a coworker saw was not a typical wildlife track. On this day, we decided to go to the Paiute Mountain to cover illegal OHV trails. As the day was going, we covered five illegal trails around the Landers Meadow area, then decided to head for the Weldon and Woolstaff Meadow area. As we were heading towards the Weldon Meadow area, a rancher stopped us to ask if we saw some of his cattle. Our reply was, no. If we see them, though, we'll let you know. We never found them. At Weldon Meadow, we stopped for lunch, and this was our next area to work. During lunch, the co-worker went to do a little exploring. After about 10 minutes, the co-worker yelled to me to come see and ID some wildlife tracks. These were not wildlife tracks. We saw what looked like something like a human foot track, but it was way too big with a slight distortion in the toe. The tracks measured about 16 inches long and 7 inches wide. The tracks looked like the ones I saw last year at the Six Rivers National Forest. I snapped a picture of the track and looked to see where the tracks were going. The tracks followed the barbed wire fence. The meadow area is used for cattle grazing. The coworker asked me what it meant. I just said, It's possible that Bigfoot was looking for food or was heading for the spring at the end of the fence. We then proceeded to do our work so that we could finish this area and head for the other area. We finished and headed towards the Woolstaff Meadow area. Once down there, we proceeded to do our job. While working on the project, I spotted the same tracks that we saw earlier. The tracks cut across the trail and headed towards some rock outcroppings. This was enough to spook my coworker, and so we left the area. Back at the office, the coworker told me what we saw and was laughed at. I didn't tell them that I snapped pictures of the tracks. I too would have been laughed at. First, as a matter of background, I want to tell a little about myself. It will help explain the delay in ever having reposted this incident. 
The sighting occurred about three months prior to my entering the United States Army. I served for three years as a paratrooper with a top secret clearance. After my time in the service, I became a Los Angeles police officer. I did that for 13 years and am now a federal agent, working for the OIG out of Washington, D.C. With that background, you can probably understand my reluctance to discuss this sighting with too many people. It really boils down to a potential career killer. That being said, the incident did occur, and I remember it vividly. Many, many years after the event, I reconnected with my friend, who was the witness, and asked him to tell me the story as he recalled it. I wanted to check my memory and see if it matched mine. It did. To a T. Only a few months ago, I spoke with my brother-in-law, a witness after the fact. I asked him if he remembered the event. He did. It should be known that he is not the kind of person that would buy into such a story. He had not been semi-involved. Anyway, this is what happened. My friend Craig and I were both 17 years old and waiting to leave for Army basic training. He was due to leave in June, and I would go in August of 1980. We were staying with my sister and brother-in-law at the time. They lived in a cabin in Green Valley, California. Craig and I enjoyed our last months as civilians in that area and used it to train for the difficult training ahead of us. We ran every day along the mountain roads and hiked the hills, trying to get into prime shape. In May, we decided to test ourselves and camp out for a full seven days. We knew the perfect place for this would be what we called the old campground because of its isolated surroundings and terrain that would be perfect for climbing and hiking. So, we packed up a week's worth of supplies and, though my sister Cindy and her husband Tom offered to drive us, we decided to act like soldiers and walk to the location. We did this with full packs. My sister and Tom advised us that they would check on us at least every other day and that they would bring us food and lemonade and such. Tom also offered to provide us with two weapons to be used for protection against any strangers that might try to harm us. After all, this was before cell phones and we would be on our own big time. There was also a heavy rattlesnake threat in that area, so we happily took him up on the offer. Tom met us at an area near the mine shafts later that day and gave us an M1 rifle and a 12 gauge shotgun, ammo for both as well. The dirt trail that leads off the main highway goes very far back into the mountains. In fact, where you traverse it to its end, you would end up on top of what is known as Grass Mountain. Craig and I decided to get about three miles in and away from the highway, which was about a mile past what was once an old 1920s campground, and live deep in the bush like soldiers would. We found a great spot, next to a clear running creek, and set up our tent in the clearing that was there. This clearing was completely surrounded by thick woods. Then, night fell. As we laid in our tents, talking by the light of flashlights, we both heard the very loud snap of deadfall in the woods behind the tent. We sat up, frozen and listening. We heard what sounded like a very large and heavy person, slowly walking around our sight, making no effort to conceal his presence. Judging from the loud sound of breaking sticks and brush, we were both scared, believing that someone was out there. We exited the tent, Craig with a shotgun and me with the M1. I started yelling very loud, Hey, we know you are there. We have guns and we'll shoot. Again, we heard the sound of somebody walking slowly, but methodically, around from our left to right. We shined our lights in the direction, but could not see anything but the trees and brush. We talked amongst ourselves, wondering if it could be a bear or something, but we decided that it was a person and not an animal. After much yelling and warning that we would shoot, I decided to fire a few rounds in the direction of the noise. How crazy that sounds now, and I did just that. I fired about three rounds into the trees, and the sound was unbelievable. The weapon blasted and the sound echoed into the night, roaring into the canyons and fading off into the night air. We stood in silence. To our utter disbelief and eventual horror, whatever it was began to move again. 
still left to right, in a circle around us. What we both thought and discussed later was that no animal would have stuck around after the horrific noise of the M1. Most normal people would have not stuck around either. Whoever or whatever was out there not only stuck around, but appeared from the casual sound of the slow walking to be less than concerned about our weapons. We made a decision to vacate the area post-haste. Grabbing our coats, we climbed the embankment up the dirt road, carrying our weapons. We ran the entire way, about three miles more or less, back to the main highway. We spent a very long night, curled up in a concrete drainage ditch, waiting for the sun to rise. Every hour or so, a lone truck would come by and the sound of that brought us comfort. Again, it was a long night. The next day, we hiked back to the site, expecting to find our tent and all of our supplies missing. To our surprise, everything was as we had left it. Nothing was out of place. We gathered our things and hiked back to the open area of the old campground. We decided to not sleep in the tent because it limited our vision, and instead laid our sleeping bags out in an open area above the creek. After a day of climbing cliffs and cooking and such, night fell again. That night, just as the sun set and darkness was beginning to fall, Craig and I were walking in the direction of the main road. We were looking for rattlesnakes because we had shot one earlier on the dirt road in the same area. As we walked side by side with me on the left, both holding weapons, we saw it. Standing just on the dirt road, facing us, was a Bigfoot. There can be no doubt at all about what it was. We could see it very clearly. He was about eight or nine feet tall and stood with his left shoulder even with the edge of the trail. He was covered with dark hair and had long arms. We did not smell anything unusual, as I have since read about other sightings. The strange thing about him was the absolute indifference in his expression. He did not look threatening. He did not look scared. He just stood there looking at us, almost bored. I instinctively brought my right hand up against Craig's chest, and we both stopped dead in our tracks. We never took our eyes off the Bigfoot as we spoke. I said, Do you see that? Are we seeing this? And Craig just said, What do we do? What should we do? We both started to walk backwards as we spoke, very slowly and involuntarily. The Bigfoot just looked at us for a few moments. Then, I will never forget the detail of this. He just slowly and very casually turned to his left and began to walk into the forest. When he did that, Craig and I stopped and started talking over each other. Do we shoot it? Should we shoot it? What do we do? Do you want to follow it? As we talked, we heard a sound that we both immediately recognized from the prior night. The sound of the Bigfoot slowly walking deeper into the woods, breaking deadfall, twigs and branches as he went. We never did fire a shot or follow him. We stayed up late and slept in shifts at the campground and did not hear from the Bigfoot again. The next day, Tom came up with food and supplies. We ran to him and told him the details of what had happened. It was very clear by his expression that he did not believe us. We took him to the exact spot where we saw the Bigfoot, and we discovered a trail of giant footprints leading from the trail into the woods. Tom smiled and told us that we did a good job making them. We were so frustrated and begged Tom to follow the tracks with us. We all followed them and they went into and across the creek. On the other side, we found a large red anthill with a footprint right on top of it. I asked Tom, how could we have done that? He just shook his head and smiled. We followed the tracks to a point where two large hills formed a valley that sloped upwards into the mountain. The ground turned rocky and the prints stopped. That is what happened. I have lived with this memory for many years. I am now 45 years old and am less concerned about what people think of me in terms of this incident. It is a fact and because of it, I know for sure that Bigfoot lives or at least once lived in the area of Green Valley, California. Me and a friend at the time were hiking in the Angeles National Forest. My friend was just out of boot camp 
USMC, and we started hiking as often as time would allow. We were hiking down a small stream bed that went downhill. The stream was all dried up, and it was mostly rock hopping, until we got to the bottom of the hill. At one point, there is a small section off to the side that is just dirt, and makes for a much easier walk down to the bottom. When we got to the bottom, we hiked a bit more, but as the sun started to go down, we headed back up the same hill, creek bed. I followed my own boot tracks back up as I was tired of rock hopping. While going up, the smell in the air was horrible, like rotten eggs or portable toilet. I then noticed on one of my tracks laid a dead ground squirrel right over my boot track. I pointed this out to my friend and as soon as I did this, a loud banging over a short hillside was heard. It was coming from about 35 to 50 yards away from us. It sounded as if a large log being hit against a tree. I looked at where the noise was coming from and noticed the tops of the trees were swaying back and forth. All this time of the swaying of the trees, the pounding on them could be heard. Then the pounding stopped and a loud groan and scream were heard from the same area as the pounding of the trees. I have never heard anything like it. I've heard mountain lion, black bear. This was nothing like that. And it was very, very loud. To the point it was damn scary. My friend asked if we should look over the small hillside to see what was making the noise. I told him no way, and he agreed. When we started walking away, the banging and screaming would stop. But as soon as we stopped, it would proceed with the groan and screaming, and the trees would start swaying again. We finally got out of there, and my friend did not want to talk about what happened. About 15 years ago, I was 17, 18. I went on a hike with a friend trying to reach Smith Mountain on the edge of San Gabriel Wilderness. We made it to the saddle where the trail goes downhill into the wilderness and where we were supposed to leave the trail and go south up the mountain and decided we didn't feel like going any further. I'm assuming we rested for a while and I remember just talking and hanging out. As we were getting up and ready to go, we heard a strange noise coming from the bushes nearby. We stopped talking and listened and it was a very loud, very low sort of growl, snuffling sound. My first thought was that it was probably a bear, but that ultimately I had no idea what it was, and it sounded like it was growling at us. The bushes along the trail were so very high, such so that we couldn't even see through them. It scared the hell out of us, and we quickly hoofed it back down the trail. I'm not sure if we ever spoke about it again, except to maybe say I wonder what it was, that was scary, etc. But afterwards, I actually looked through the field guides, trying to figure out what was making the noise. I knew that bears, mountain lions, and bobcats are relatively prevalent in that part of San Gabriel Mountains, so I assumed it was probably one of those. But after looking around at other sightings near that area, I'm beginning to wonder. In retrospect, it sounded a bit ape-like, very low-pitched, so that we almost couldn't hear it at all and had to ask each other, do you hear that? Take it as you must. I just think it's an interesting in the context of the other sightings to the area. I only wish I could remember any more details in that we had the cojones to hang around longer and check it out further. My girlfriend, who later became my wife, and I were traveling on a rural road, Panama Road, that connects the outskirts of Bakersfield, California, to Lamont, California, just a small town 14 miles outside of Bakersfield. This area is surrounded by agricultural fields, mostly grape vineyards. I was traveling at approximately 55 miles an hour that was pushing it for my 65 Mustang at the time. As we talked, we both saw something walking very fast, almost a slow jog across the roadway. I slowed down without slamming on the brakes so as to not lose control and try to figure out what we were seeing. We saw its right side and back as it ran into the field. The head to the shoulders was slouched, could not see a neck. It was approximately six feet tall, long arms and thick legs. It never looked at us as it crossed. It was extremely dark, almost shadowy but very much real. 
appeared to be very hairy. As we passed it, it never looked back. I quickly stopped and began a U-turn, at which time my girlfriend yelled at me, asking what the hell I was doing. She knew what I was about to do. I drove back to the location to where it ran into the field and I hit my bright lights. Did not see anything. My girlfriend was yelling at me to get going, so I did. I returned to the area the following day, but it had rained and I could not locate any footprints. It was too muddy. My wife will only discuss it if I bring it up. Aside from that, she never talks about it. To this day, I have no idea what we saw. I know that it was not human as we know it, yet I cannot say that it was a complete animal either. I still drive by there once in a while and wonder what it was that we saw that night.